Entertainment Enterprises. I helped develop a product called Ivar Radio. Um, hopefully some of you folks have heard of it. We're getting there. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm going to throw out the rest of the panel, but we're going to talk a little bit about social media discovery. We're going to take a couple different tacks here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the problems and the challenges faced there and how you, um, uh, how you can reach an, a new audience, both in terms of um, uh, being a publisher and also from the point of view of, of artists. Um, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about services and platforms that we find meaningful. I'm just going to throw it right to Arjun. Good <laughs> Intro. Yeah. Who are you? Uh, I'm RJ from Pitchfork. Uh, I'm the vice president of video production at Pitchfork. So I think more heavily on video content, obviously. Um, that's great, we love it. Pisces? Aquarius. 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 Yeah. 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 Won't go there. <laughs> Across the planet. Yep. I know where I know where you're going with that. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm JP Lesmanas, I work at BET, um, and I head up the social media team there, work closely with the digital group, but also with the programming group, and then um, intimately embedded into the 106 and Park extravagant. And we get to talk a little bit about a stunt that you pulled earlier this week. Correct. All right, and Jeff. Sure, Jeff Roberto, Director of Consumer Marketing uh, for Shazam. I'm assuming here everyone knows uh, Shazam is what we do. Uh, I manage uh, global marketing in terms of acquisition, retention, and promotions, partnerships. Uh, so we're close with labels, brands, bring the two together on our platform. So we took the time to actually do some prep for this panel, and we talked a little bit about things uh, that we're going to address here, and I'm going to do everyone a big favor by throwing that out the window and starting with a question that we didn't prepare for. Um, all of us are in this business because, first and foremost, we're fans, and obviously the tools and the platforms that have emerged of late help us as fans, at least we hope that they do. So the first question I have for the panel is, in your travels as a music fan, as a consumer of media, what are the platforms that you find yourself leaning on and relying on, and why start JK? So, um, I am not only a fan because I work at it, but I've been a DJ for just under 15 years, and uh, so we didn't have to though. This is 10. Um, Can I have my moment or what? Yeah. <laughs> so <you> like that. <laughs> um, and you know, like back in the day, you go to the record store and you, you wandered around and you like became boys with the guy you know who you know, like used to give you good records. Like, hey, come back here. Here's white labels, like all this cool stuff. And now, you know, that person can be any one of a thousand people. Um, and it, it gets very, very difficult to figure out who it is. I can say first and foremost, um, because I have a kind of music basis. I'm sure many of you do. Like, I rely on my friends. You know, like, and you know, so it's like. And you know, like my white aunt was sitting outside there, and I was like, yo, aunt, yeah, like, you know, what are you listening to these days? And so that's probably the first tier. And I think the second one is, you know, I found a handful of, of blogs and of writers, um, you know, who review stuff that I like. Um, and it's probably similar to, like, movie critics, you know, like, if you like Roger Ebert, and he tends to, you know, rate the stuff that you like well, then you go there. So, so you know, probably, like, really insular, like, friends, and then the bloggers that I like, and then I really like SoundCloud. Like, I, I pop on there, like, you know, do some searches, find some stuff. That's how I found Flying Lotus a couple of years ago, and um, a couple other books. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's kind of it's kind of that circle of fun um, from really you know, inner circle to a little bit outside. I think it's interesting. We're going to pause just a second to let Joseph introduce himself. Thank you for joining us. Not at all. Uh, my name is Joseph Patel. I am uh, the VP of Content Creator for the MySpace. All right, so we were just talking about platforms that we lean on in our personal lives as music fans as a sort of an entree into this particular topic. Interesting what you said. Um, I think every one of these platforms is trying to recreate something that's natural to all of us and that's worth them out. And I think a lot of the platforms that we're going to talk about offer that promise for fans and for musicians. I think it's a little noisier than that. And I think that's one of the challenges we're going to address here. So I'm going to now throw it to Jeff and talk a little bit about those platforms. Yeah, sure. So I'm a uh, you know, big, big fan of social. We, we've done a lot of integration with social at Shazam. Um, yeah, you know, even before that, I got spent five or six with my friends here. So, so you know, fully immersed in kind of social media. Um, 
you know, today I think it's about Twitter, it's about Instagram, it's obviously Facebook, I mean, all, all the big platforms in my space kind of re-emerging now. Um, I think all of these play into how we discover. Um, although, I want to have that by saying, uh, even though I have a lot of friends on these platforms, I don't necessarily. Um, like everything my friends are listening to. Right. And so the, the constant you know, updates from you know, Spotify, other apps, even Shazam, we you know, post on social networks. I, don't I take up the of salt. I don't necessarily use that as a primary form of discovery, but I think the, the distribution of these platforms offers very of course. And so finding the people to follow, finding those specific folks in the industry, the taste makers, and, and see what they are listening to. So and that, that's why there will always be a role for a company like Pitchfork. Right, so I think you know what we hear here is that not all of our friends have permission to give us recommendations about music. You might like to have a beer with them. You don't want to know what they're listening to. And I work at Clear Channel, so I know that better than anybody. Sitting there. So, I mean, honestly, I don't even have a Facebook account, partially because I, the noise there is just un, unuseful to me. I don't think of social as a discovery tool because it says it. Facebook or Twitter person. I'm lucky enough that I have, you know, surrounded by critics, writers, people who eat, sleep, and breathe music, and, you know, have, uh, you know, a wealth of different new emerging things coming out that, that uh, you know, we, I can kind of take advantage of that other people don't. That's not terribly useful to everyone else, but that's how I find it through friends, through, through other people. Why do you have to support it? <laughs> I mean, I think the, the one thing that I, I, I mentioned before that I think one of the, the most useful social tools for discovery that ever existed was in the original MySpace. The way that uh, you know you could go around and find the the artists that you like, and then you see who like their top friends were, mm -hmm. and it was kind of this like you know not really passive, but it was you know you could just without them like bludgeoning you over the head, you'd be like, oh wow, there's no age this band I've never heard of. Amazing for there's you know any number at the sound or whoever it may be and being able to find that that's one like huge missing link I think and I don't hopefully maybe that's a part of the new MySpace but yeah. it's a, it, for me I don't want I don't you know I think like we've all kind of said that I mean while we listen to music that our friends like or we might interact with a select few and get recommendations from them generally like I, I don't see the social networks like Facebook or Twitter as being a place where you're going to discover that. But I think, like, for my personal opinion, hearing from the artists that I like, hearing from those people that I follow, I find that to be much, much more interesting. So it's like a backdoor curation. I think it's a great segue uh, just for you to talk about how MySpace is addressing this particular concern for the artist community. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I agree with you. Like I said, I'm not on Facebook because it's too much noise. Um, I also think that, you know, I don't necessarily need, like, I don't need to know what my friends are listening to. I don't, I don't like them as curators necessarily from my experiences because I actually make new friends from the stuff I listen to. And I think that's a part of this social map that is missing. Um, the number of friends I've made who I met at a show or, you know, who you like this album too, I'm you know, buying records at a record store. That's how I made a lot of my friends. And I think a lot of the social mapping that even MySpace is doing and other sites are doing doesn't take that into consideration. I think one of the reasons why the new MySpace is starting is because no one really filled that void that, that used to be there when, when MySpace was in the public consciousness. You know, um, I think A Track wrote an article on Huffington Post like six or seven months ago where he said you know he missed that, which is you know discovering a banger from the Daft Punk MySpace page and who they like. So I think it's important that there are curators and gatekeepers. It doesn't need to be five. I think it needs to be decentralized a bit, but it also doesn't need to be. I think there's a sort of happen. Can I ask you a quick follow up? Sure. So when you go to shows and you meet people who are new, how do you then keep in touch with them to get those music recommendations exchange ideas around? Well, it's not necessarily getting music recommendations, but it's, I think it's, you know, uh, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, what's your email address, Twitter, and stuff like that. But, but I think it's also, you know, one of the things that I'm, my plan for, for content is, uh, I think MySpace is a music service primarily right now, but, you know, when I was a teenager, like, Music was how I got into photography and film and style and design. And I kind of want to do content that replicates that experience because I think it's much more about the culture around music and less about the actual music. You know, it's about who did the artwork for my favorite album. Um, 
I didn't know, you know, when I was a teenager and I was obsessed with Bauhaus, I didn't know what Bauhaus was as an art school. I thought it was just a band, right? So then, then, I, then I got into that and minimalism and all that sort of stuff. And so it's like, I think it's just important that, you know, especially the one, one related thing I'd like to say is, you know, algorithms I think can be useful, but I think the problem with algorithms that I have is that as a recommendation tool, that it, everything you get recommended is derivative of something else. And sometimes you just like, you slap it upside the head and something you wouldn't weren't expecting. And that's sort of the romance of I think music that we've all personally gone through. But it's a challenge of what I like to call trusted sources. So this idea of there is going to be some piece of your network, and that can be people, it can be editorial sources, um, it can be people you've never heard of. Um, who are allowed, who have permission to, to tell you something, who have permission to curate on your behalf. And there's the signal to noise ratio has gotten to the point where social was seen as a solution now really feels like, in fact, part of the problem. Which I think is really obvious when you listen to what some of the folks in the space are talking about. Daniel X spent a lot of time in Q4 talking about uh, his um, belief that the Spotify platform wasn't doing a good job of recommending music to people. Um, Beats obviously took a lot of care and effort into hiring people like, you know, Nine Inch Nails and you know, bringing in folks who understand this problem, Ian from Topspin, and attempt to address this question of what, what he calls what song comes next. Um, I think, you know, the real question is, is there any hope that networks this large and distributed can offer anything that sounds like, hey, you've got to hear this new band. Or are we fooling ourselves? You know, from both the artist's standpoint, I mean, I'll throw out the straw man, do we think that it's even something that is possible to do at scale? I mean, I think there's value to it. It maybe just isn't that, you know, it's not the value that you're asking for. You know, it's not the value that you've got to hear this thing. I think those things come in different ways. I think it is interesting to see kind of on a more like analytical level what is what how these things are hitting and how these, you know, who's listening to what, but it's more of a like almost kind of like a professional tool than it is a uh, you know like a, a social like a pure gut level thing. Um, but I do think, you know, there are there are other entities for you know that directly cater to curation and recommendation those kinds of things. Is that on a social network? Could it be? Yes, it can be. I, mean, I think like I just said, like you know, those there are things that I think it's just a matter of like the hierarchy of you know who and what are recommending those things to you. And where that hits you. Some people it might come from their friends, some people it's gonna come from the artists themselves. Some people, you know, it's maybe somewhere in between. But I think those are like kind of the keys to it. It's, you know, the, the, the hierarchy of where the who is recommending this music is is, is hugely important. And it's different for every record. I would actually have to push back on that in, Great. In, in a little bit in the sense that if you think about the investment it took to discover a new band 15 years ago, right? Like if you told me, hey, you need to listen to this, and that's the, what we're trying to replicate. 15 years ago, I'd have to go to the store, buy a record, spend my money, go home, hope I liked it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't like it, either rationalize like, like that or, 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 or I feel like I wasted money. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you can tell me about a new band that I don't know about, and within 10 minutes, I can listen to everything they've ever done, seen every video, read every bio. That's not a huge investment for us. So I think trying to find the perfect formula that replicates, hey, listen to this band, maybe isn't the goal. It shouldn't be the goal. I'm glad you pushed back. I just hope yeah, no, because I think I think you know it's, it, and then it's just up to me to, to like I don't think any of us want to have a program music experience, or sometimes we do and most sometimes we don't. But I think that you know the discovery is as much about the person who's discovering as it is about the people who are allowing you to discover. Well, but you touched on something that I think maybe we can push you a little bit on, which is this idea that data in some ways can be a useful tool, even if it's not the same emotional experience of having a friend call you. And yeah, can you talk to me a little bit about the flow and share some of the stuff that Shazam is doing? Yeah, so um, so we're sitting on on a mountain of data, really, um, uh, a lot, a lot of data, and um, we're we're looking at that now in terms of how do we socialize that, how do we partner around that, um, what more can we do within the industry uh, to make some of that data available and actually to, you know, to 
help people discover new music through, you know, geolocation, through an artist they may have tagged a year ago. Um, in that location, and who else is, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a particular city, um, it can be, you know, countrywide. Um, but we're, we're, we're kind of looking at that now and really approaching this with our charts, well, two ways. One, approaching it with our charts, and two, um, doing, um, doing deals that enable us to get access to more, more content and go deeper into particular genres. We just did a deal with Beatport um, two weeks ago now, announced it. And uh, that's just one example. So we're going deep in EDM, dance, electronics, whatever you may call it nowadays. And um, you know that's going to turn more people on to those types of artists when they tag it. They'll get a result, and they can share that. So um, the work that the people are doing already, yes. by dint of them having the app and using the app. Right. And, and, and then we'll, we'll apply charts to that. So we we'll use charts as a way within that genre and potentially within that geolocation to you know to start you know surfacing what what might be hot in that. that thing. Lists are very. <coughs> yeah. Do you want to? Uh, well, I would just I all I, I keep thinking about this idea of sometimes you need to be smacked inside the head outside the head with something you're not. It's kind of a complete departure. Sorry. I mean, like, I, I, you know that that you know I think part of the thing is too for all, for everyone you get kind of ingrained in these ruts of certain kinds of things and you know one of the other needs I, I feel like there is is for something that can kind of force you to kind of break out of that or can at least you at least confront you with something that, that might be different that's where the Amazon yeah. model breaks down right because if you're only getting recommendations right. on the eighth Wilco record you bought and, right and that's where the kind of like the algorithms that you're talking about just are you know they, for whatever reason it just, it just doesn't work and I, and I think that's just other gap to I think there's also there's like a missing there's a missing input that that I don't think anyone has cracked their code on yet, which is there are people it's like my wife, you know, she likes music, she's not into music as much as I am, and she's one of those people like when she goes to a concert, she wants to hear pretty close to the track that she purchased. You know, she's like, because that's why I came here. Like, I wanted to see Dave Matthews perform the track that I love. I want I want it close to it. Wrong that exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you wanted. She picked yeah. the wrong exactly. thing. Exactly, exactly. So she's disappointed every time. Right. But you know, like, and for me, it's the exact opposite. Like, I want to hear it nothing like. And and I don't think we've cracked that code yet. Like, there are people who just want to get the Amazon. They want to get, like, the thing that the algorithm serves up. And then there are people, probably like everybody in this room, who, like, that's why I love Quest love sets. You know, like you go in and he's like, he's gonna play, you know, two chains, and then he's gonna play Miles Davis, and you're like, what? You know, like, but that's what I want. It's not what everyone wants, but I don't feel like there's any service out there where I can say, today I feel like I just kind of want to be on brand, and today I want you to slap me upside the face. That's the difference between human curation that's right. and machine that's right. curation. That's right. Having said that, we all like to complain about machine curation. Pandora does very, very well. Yeah, they do. Pandora has a huge audience based around that, and by the way, so is iHeart Radio. But we also have this human curation element. And I think that the emotional connection is always going to fall first and foremost, you know, like it did with MySpace, on that connection with an artist or a friend or a person, which is why we keep coming back to this hope that one of these platforms is going to come along and help solve that for us. I think we're all looking at you and hoping that you guys have figured something <laughs> out. I mean, our, our approach is very much, it's, it's a mix of data and human curation. It's, it's a mix of social and with that as well. Because I think, you know, my personal attitude, and I think it's reflected in what we're trying to do, we're not, we're not even close to being there yet, but is there's power in saying, I don't like this. There is a power to that. It's, it happens in looking for apartments in New York City, it happens when you're dating. In saying no, you actually learn what you want. And I think there's something about that that's very human that, that no mix of algorithm and data can ever replicate. And I think, because I learn about myself by what I don't like, as, as much as I find out what I do. And I think that's that's a really important thing. So I don't know if there's a code to be cracked necessarily, other than um, to provide an experience that fits, I think, human nature. You know. And as product people, I think we can fall into um, the trap of building something for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all descri described a whole bunch of different use cases that might fall outside of the incredible intense geekiness that is assembled around this table. <laughs> and I've raised my hand first on that front because you know it's sort of like. I knew Deer Hunter, and then I'm like, oh, there's Atlas Sounds too. Oh my God! And trust me, that's not, well. We're not going to get Sharon Dassler to play on Z100. That's for sure. No matter how good we think it is.
So I, I do I do feel like um, you know it's a question that can't be answered because there are as many use cases out there as there are people. The, the other part about this that is really interesting to me, like you mentioned SoundCloud earlier. I love SoundCloud. Um, but is SoundCloud Z? Like really the things I love about SoundCloud, if you actually apply the law to them, it would be illegal. And and I keep coming back to this idea that a lot of the stuff that 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 I like and that the services are trying to do, there's such a legal minefield to, to navigate mm -hmm. that, that really, if SoundCloud wanted to go legit, and, and I, from what I hear, they're going to be, a lot, half the stuff that I like on SoundCloud is going to be removed the first day. You know, doing deals with majors, they, they, they require you to use a service that, you know, um, picks out things that are in copyright. Right. And to be fair, though, YouTube had the same problem, sure. and they worked through that. And I think we were talking on our prep call on Friday regarding how you guys have used YouTube, and it's drawing a completely different kind of audience, and helping those people find stuff inside of your brand that they wouldn't have found. Otherwise. Right. Well, it's different. It's like, you know, you can tap into an audience of people that may not be familiar with the work at all. And I think the, book, the key thing about uh, YouTube users is that they're active. They're more active than, like, any other social group, if you consider them. Like a social network is they're they're there to watch videos and unlike you know Twitter where you might just like something and not bother watching and listening or whatever YouTube users are active and they are going to hit play and they're going to thumb it up or down and comment on it and I think that's uh, you know, that that that's what makes it so so interesting to me I mean obviously I'm also on the video side of things. I mean, it, it, you know, there, there, are, there are downsides to it too. I mean, and there are downsides to all of these networks when you start to get into people looking at feeds as opposed to coming, you know, for someone like us coming to our site where we have, you know, where we're curating and doing things. Um, and the way that those are run, when you get into the monetization side of that, it's a little bit more complicated. But in terms of just growing your audience, I think all of them are, are huge on that front. For, from my point of view, YouTube is one of the best on that because of the active nature of the user. So it's actually a really good place to, to, to switch gears and I think to take it back to what the last panel was talking about, which is, you know, there's this other side of it, which is, you know, what artists ought to be thinking of and, you know, from your editorial standpoint, from your sort of content curation standpoint, from your standpoint looking data on a big platform, all of that stuff. Um, I think there's a, there is still a big question about um, um, are, we, are we looking at platforms that they become bifurcated along format or genre? Are there certain f platforms and formats that work better for, say, urban music? And, or, or is that just, you know, is that just an old wives' tale? And what do you see, you know, when you're, when you're looking at these communities? And what kind of advice are you, um, are you offering to the artists you work with? So, um, first I want to answer a question that you didn't really ask. Which, um, which is, it's really interesting to me because I feel like more and more, you know, social blank discovery is like, insert video here. You know, like, because it's, you know, like, you know, we were talking right before the panel about you know, the YouTube, you know, like, whole thing with Billboard now, tracking the number of views. And so, like, is that music or is that video? Like, you know, slowly and slowly, like, those two are becoming one. I mean, you know, the, here for the New Yorkers in the room, you know, like, you know, Star and Buckwild, like, you know, their show is, we're gonna put a microphone in front of people and turn a, you know, turn a camera on. So like, that's, you know, that's video discovery also. And I think, you know, part of what- You couldn't have mentioned the power, you couldn't mention the power one show. Right, Just saying breakfast club, I'm just saying. That's a breakfast club. You know, and, and I think one of the, the you know, the, the pieces of, of information that we're relaying on to folks is, you know, there are, there are a lot more music discovery, pardon me, there are a lot more video discovery things now. And so, like, make it visually interesting. You know, like, it used to be that you could just be a band, you know, like, and you didn't have to have a full video. You didn't even have to look good. You know, it's like, like, it didn't matter. You know, like, and now, like, all of that stuff matters all the time because there are so many people discovering music through the video that you make. And so, you know, of course, you know, BET, we're a television channel, so we're all about video, and we're a lot about video on our, on our websites. Um, but, you know, that, and so as, you know, self-serving for us, we're like, hey, you know, like, send us more video. Um, but I think that is the general trend. People are discovering more stuff through the visual and getting back-ended into the music, which, to be honest with you, I don't necessarily think is a wonderful thing, because you can be a great musician, a 
really, really shitty video. <laughs> well, let, let's, let me push you on that just a little bit. Some people would say that that revolution happened in the 80s with MTV, right? So I think maybe to help you maybe steer this a little bit is, I think what I'm hearing now is the shorter form is better. Why did the problem shake work? Well, A, it was easy to do, but B, it was only 30 seconds. That's right. Right, and that feels obvious, and there are apps that are specifically designed to help that, and those things then can be tagged, and they're easy to upload, and easy to manage, as opposed to a 300 megabyte, that's right, that's right. gigabyte file. Right. And also, you have to manage the creativity around it. You know, it's not it's not that it's 30 or two minutes and 30. It's not that you know it's a you know a full fledged concert or something on your webcam. It's it's about being more creative, which I think for some artists, for some musicians. Um, is incredibly empowering. You talked about how you're a musician, but you're also a photographer. You know, so and a lot of you know artistic people <coughs> like to dabble in those too. And I think that those are the people who are going to be winning more and more. The people who are full range multimedia artists. Um, isn't that why possible. EDM? Isn't that one of the reasons why EDM is doing well? I'll throw it out there: dance music. It's a sort of a multi-sensory um, experience. Right, drugs. When, when we had <laughs> drugs, drugs. drugs. You know, when, we, when we had Swedish House Mafia at the Heart Radio Music Festival, I think a lot of sort of traditional, more traditional you know, rock or pop programmers were saying to themselves, how are they going to create a sense of dynamism in front of 15,000 people? And I'll be damned if they weren't the most dynamic visual set that we had that in Dead Mouse. Most interesting, most sort of sensory of all of the, of the acts that played at the festival. So I think there's a lot there. Yeah, I was just going to jump in. I, uh, I uh, was fortunate enough to see them last week in San Francisco. I can tell you um, what a show it was. I uh, was amazed. They sold four nights out, Bill Graham, the largest venue in the city. Major acts can't even sell it out four nights in a row. Massive um, quarter, two nights in a row, three nights in a row. Exactly. Easy. And you know, talking to folks there, obviously the you know, average age was, was, was younger, but talking to folks there um, in terms of you know where they're from, that they're traveling, some of from Colorado, some flew down from Canada. Um, this is their last tour, it's a big deal. We're following this band. For now. For now, until they, you know, until they split up and do solo projects. Um, this, this is the last tour. But, but anyway, you know, that, that's a big deal. Uh, you don't see that kind of passion. Well, you do see that passion, but not that scale. Uh, and, things very and how is social, guys? How is social propelling that? I think that's the question that's relevant to everybody. Because obviously, it's beyond just, I love this track, and you tell your friends. Do we have a sense? Do we have a, do we have a read on how, how these guys, I mean, I'm, just, I'm looking at you a little bit on this one um, as a sort of subject matter expert because I, I really feel like that's a big piece of what makes EDM. Yeah. What are we doing now? I mean, you know, for me, dance music is always communal. So I think that it's, it's so easily social, just by definition. Um, I'm a little on the fence about EDM because every brand we do is. Because the fans are traveling and they are affluent and they have, they're young. They're, it's, it's, it's the sweet spot for, for brands. They're young and affluent. They, 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 they want lifestyle. Well, the it's, fact that it has an acronym kind of. Yeah, and, and, yeah right. and, it, and it's, you know, but I, I think inherently uh, dance music is communal and I think that's what makes it so sweet, right? So whether the Twitter existed or not, that, that, that audience would still be coming. I think that's fair. All right, um, before it gets too late, I think we want to throw it out to the audience. Thanks, guys. This is really great stuff. Anybody questions? You have a mic and everything. I promise I won't make fun of you much. Hi. I got one question, maybe half rant, half question. Um, does that come from more um, very pre digital music? Um, and it kind of struck me, you know, what you said, like now you don't just look at one band and one song, you know everything about them, you know what they eat for breakfast, you know that they take the subway. And, you know, people are human, so now you know that this guy is a rock star. He's a guy that, you know, is a jerk half the time and, you know, dresses in sweatpants and all. Um, in addition, there's no, zero kind of anticipation. As soon, within 10 minutes, you have the whole discography, you know, an album drops and you don't wait up at midnight in, in a big line outside Tower Records. You just, whenever, you yeah, click and download. Do you guys see that, um, here's the question part. <laughs> Do you guys see that as basically like a horse that's left the barn? For bands, or like you know, a bubble, where at some point somebody's going to say, you know, all this access to these guys, a lot of it's boring. You know, or a lot of it's like mm -hmm. there's no mysticism left. Like I'm not getting the mm, that I get when like I've waited three years for an album and it, and I have to go physically get it. And, you know, there's a whole additional sensory process. I, mean, I, 
think that's up to the artist. But there are a lot of people that are going to, I think you'll start seeing people kind of pull back on that overexposure and the coming years because it's absolutely true. I mean, the other part of it, though, is, you know, the, you know, the releasing of the way that people <coughs> consume and digest content. I don't think that there's, I don't know, it's kind of a catch point too because there are interesting things happening in other, I mean, I don't know how much this fits, but I think about, like, the, uh, the new series on Netflix, like House of Cards, where they drop an entire season yep. at one time, and I seriously sat there for 13 hours and <laughs> <laughs> watched it all at once. So there, there are interesting things there, but I think there are other people that are like, I think that the artists themselves are, are starting to think like, are starting to see that trend and realize that they don't necessarily want to kind of play into that and, you know, be a part of you know, all doing this just constant promo and like stuff that's not really worth their while and something that has like integrity for them. I think that they'll be the ones that, that pull that back. There is a cash money too though, right? Because on, on the on the one hand on the one hand, Rihanna's done very well putting out a record every year and there's no mystery, but she creates good songs that people love every year and she works and collaborates, right? And then Lady Gaga is a, a little bit of a you know, not to say that she won't come back and do amazing things because it'd be hard to bet against her very hard, um, but she's been out of the spotlight for a while, and if you just look at it from a data standpoint, her social graph has really quieted down a lot. So, you know, I, I think the horse has left the barn. I don't know that that's a bad thing. It's sort of like saying, you know, in my day, I had 45s in a box, and I, boy, that was so much cooler back then. It's just different. Well, it's also different. An answer to the question that you were asking before, like, is there, are there differences across genres? Is there, you know, pop is in one place, whereas, you know, some, like other, you know, pop and EDM are wherever, somewhere between, and rap and electronic. I mean, they're all different, and there are different things that apply to each of those genres. And I think you can see differences in, in all of them. It's all, you know. Yeah, and I think you're going to start to see artists, as, uh, the anticipation thing is interesting because I used to line up in record stores on the day the record came out too, but I think you're starting to see that. I think rappers are really good at that in terms of teasing a mixtape, teasing a song, teasing a leak, you know exactly when it's going to happen. Uh, Justin Timberlake did this a few weeks ago when he released his first song. Um, I thought it was a little too stretched out, but it was also, but it was interesting to see at the moment the song came out, you have 20 million people talking about it on Twitter. Well, when was the last time that happened? And, and I th so I think you're starting to see some of the same dynamics in play, just going to be represented differently. Is there another question that I saw in the chat? It was more of like a comment on, based on that little discussion, but like, I don't know, I guess one of my favorite bands, Tool, still lives in the shadows. And they don't even need to release an album, they can just go on tour. And they sell out every time. And, you know, I don't even hear that they're on tour until the day before the show's in town. And I, I go and the place is completely sold out, so. What band? Tool. Oh. New fan base. There, there are a lot of props, so, you know, I got It was just like a comment to like. Yeah, I, I, I guess got still, that's still a viable. space because of that problem. Back in the late 90s, I helped to develop something called the sound. It doesn't matter. But it was because the CTO loved Nick Cave in the Bad Seeds and came to the office on a Monday and saw that they had played in New York where he lived on Saturday night and had no idea. And yeah. was furious. And coded all night to try to develop. And this is in the late 90s, so there wasn't anything. I mean, there was, you put your CD into a CD-ROM drive and you got a numbered list. <laughs> right? It was prior to, you know, Grace Note, it was prior to you know, Muse, it just put out something called the Encyclopedia of Popular Music. I mean, no metadata existed anywhere. And, and it's ironic that you're still complaining. I, I, st I think that, you know, there's bands in town, it's, but it's a real complaint. No, no, I'm right? not complaining, I'm just commenting that, you know, that's still well, it's a viable... It's okay. <laughs> I think we've all been there. I think all of us have been there. And I, I think that there are products out there, but it's hard. It's hard to know about all the products. That's I think not what he's saying. Sorry. I think we're saying is though that there's an entire ecosystem of artists that are living in that personal right. lab. Right. I mean, maybe Tool has such a, 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 just a fan base fan that's base. so dedicated. Right. Yeah, but I think I think th those bands are dying out because yeah. I don't think if Tool came out now they could get away with the same thing. Right. I mean, I think I think. Well, but it's based on what he was saying. I mean, Tool did it. The way that Tool did it is kind of what. Saying, you know, it wasn't like oh, tools like out in like every like right. acoustic session you know, or whatever. You know, like, <laughs> yes. The way that they did it is what helped like you know make, yeah. Yeah, make it like a, a lasting make a lasting connection. Yeah. Like that. That's a good point. I got a I got a question. What what are these guys working on? Like to have permission for for artists? Like if I interview somebody and I and I taped them, and I put it on my uh, website, or I put it onto YouTube, and I put it onto MySpace, I connected to Twitter. 
I mean, what are you guys doing to protect the, you know, yourselves and the artists? You know what I mean? That you could broadcast that. That you could, you know, have the rights to use that. We're the wrong company and, to ask. We're all you know what I mean? We make I'm it trying. Well, how, <laughs> but what <laughs> kind of, like, you know what I mean? It must be some agreement because it's like you got to, you know, get a, uh, for their music, for their image, for their, That's right. you know, it's like, like uh, usually a label agreement. You have to then they had a chocolate bar, bar in their hand or something or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's you know, it's like, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know. You don't have no, no, uh, no thoughts on that? You know, releases. Anything with you know, yeah, 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 you know, he's from my show. He's saying, you know, SoundCloud is doing whatever they need to do. And I mean, so if they're doing it, I mean, well, what, why can't we do it? I mean, the internet's free, you know? The internet's free. Yeah. People do it all the time. Yeah. People get takedown notices. Right. Yeah, guys? Oh, right, right here. Um, uh, so you were speaking earlier about the void left by the old MySpace in terms of content creation. Um, Nowadays, it's like, you know, there is a void of curation, I agree. You know, there is a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of things that aren't trickling down to people in a way that actually recommends things personally. But I'm wondering whether that's only a void for people who actually know or care about all the noise that's out there. Like, you still have a vast majority of music consumers that see Adele on the Grammys and go out and buy 21 the next day, and then that's the only record they buy in a year. You know what I mean? So I'm wondering whether in, uh, in, in basic terms, like how big is the market for a curation platform? I think it's a great question. more about the artist's desire to get out in front of people than it is about consumers needing to get artists to find the audience. I think if you start a band today, you're going to do everything you can to get out in front of people. And in that way, if, if a, you know, if, if Deer Hunter Theoretically, if Deer Hunter likes your band and puts you as one of their top favorite bands, that's going to do gangbusters for you. And I think so, as an artist, I think it's important to be a part of that process. I, I, I still think consumers are going to find music and discover new music from a variety of different ways. But I think if you're, if you're trying to establish a career, establish a band, get something heard, it's important for you to have a, a, a number of tools in order to get in front of people. Yeah. They're all tools in the toolbox, I think is the point here. Yeah. You have to deploy what you think makes sense. And it may not make sense for every band to do a tumbler, right? Yeah. I just wanted to make a statement that actually dovetails about this question that I think that there is um, a desire um, for human curation, curation and there's been a lack of it in recent years. Consolidation of radio, Pandora, which I, I love Pandora for what it does, but um, I find that human curation gives the aha moments in listening that you don't get with non-human curation. And that's why DJs are still, you know, mega stars. That's why you know people listen to DJs, and this cuts across all genres. That somebody who lives in that space kind of has the, the feel for it better and can put together a set of music. Uh, and, 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 and introduce, do, do so much better. So to the extent that some of these tools leverage human curation, the democ democratization of human curation, I think that's a sweet spot where we should all be, be kind of cognizant of the fact that in recent years, uh, the, the, the listening public has almost been, you know, we don't even get enough of it. You, know, you have a clear channel that programs the same thing across the U.S. And, and people's ears have just been dumbed down, and then they go on on the net because they want to hear some stuff that they haven't heard before. And when they have those aha mo moments, and it can be old music, it can be catalog, it can be new music, but that 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 joy of having somebody introduce something it's like, oh, that is great. That happens from humans. I, I couldn't agree more, and, and I just want to push back a little bit. I think our curators at Cure Channel are the, are the best, and I know many of them closely, and I think they do an amazing job, and I think okay. that the popularity of our stations proves that out. I mean, uh, there's not a, um, ha having said that, human curation is vital. I think that's why a lot of the platforms, including MySpace and all the folks we're talking to here today, made sure that was an integral piece of their product before they brought it to market. Joseph and the team are taking so much time doing what they're doing because they want to strike the right balance. Jimmy Iovine wants to do the right thing. Pitchfork is so successful because it is, it is the human element 
that drives that. You know, we've got people on this panel, obviously, who spend their days trying to curate content beyond music for, for viewing audiences. I, I think you're right. I also think that we shouldn't complain about there being a lack of it. If we feel that there's a void, there are more tools than there ever have been in the history of mankind to go out and create your own little slice of curated heaven. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a great note. You gotta wrap up, everybody. I'm happy to answer any questions.